if there is going to be an earthquake in California, which is literally twelve hours away, that means almost on the opposite side of the planet, if there is going to be an earthquake in the next two days or three days, this cobra will start behaving in a certain way. If you observe it carefully, if you have mastered that observation sufficiently, you can clearly tell that there is going to be uh, an earthquake in s approximately this kind of latitude. There are people who can do that. There are certain type of yogis who always carry these mountain scorpions, which are almost like nine inches long, uh, in a box. Once in a way, they will decide when, they will take a sting from the scorpion, your whole neurological system will jangle, it'll go for twenty-four hours to forty-eight hours. Can I ask you two questions? Yes, sir. So, you mentioned this instrument that permits us to access this, uh, whatever we call it, consciousness, intelligence, uh, but you say it's, it's for humans. So, what do you think about animals and how they perceive the world? And then the second question is this terribly um, challenging one. If you say that um, somehow, and, and you make the comparison with the bubble and, and that there is no such thing as your consciousness, my consciousness, it could be an illusion. So, how do we somehow uh, deal with well, what was there before you were born and what will there be when you're dead? So these two are, are still burning questions about animals and um, the before and after this uh, living. See, uh, when it comes to animals, an animal is programmed in such a way that largely its life is uh, fixed around its survival process. Let's say, uh, for any creature for that matter, their stomach is full, their life is settled, they just sit there happily. But that's not the nature of the human being. Stomach is empty, only one problem, stomach is full, one hundred problems. This is the nature of the human being. Because survival is not the end game for us. Only when survival is taken care of, what is human kicks in, till then we are also just one more creature. When uh, we are absolutely hungry and uh, survival is in question, we are like any other creature. Human beings fight like any other creatures when survival is in question. Only when those things are taken care of, other dimensions of being human become a possibility. So survival is not the end game for us, it is the beginning for us. It is the A of life, but for all other creatures, survival is the end game for us. But even among them, certain creatures are far more capable of accessing or at least being sensitive. I wouldn't say accessing, they're little more sensitive to consciousness. Wherever there is consciousness, certain creatures behave in a certain way. In India, in the yogic culture, in the Indian mysticism, everywhere you see there will be a cobra, always. Simply because we've always seen wherever there is a little bit of, you know, access to consciousness, these creatures somehow sense it and they arrive. What makes them uh, sense it? One thing I'm guessing, this is not a certain science for me, I'm just guessing because they're stone deaf. I think they're super alert and some other… in some other sense, they're very, very alert. This is a fact, this has been uh, checked by a few people. See, for example, a cobra in southern India, it has no ears at all, no hearing mechanism, so it has got the whole body to the ground and literally ear to the ground, you know <laughs> So, if there is going to be an earthquake in California, which is literally twelve hours away, that means almost on the opposite side of the planet, if there is going to be an earthquake in the next two days or three days, this cobra will start behaving in a certain way. If you observe it carefully, if you have mastered, that observation sufficiently, you can clearly tell that there is going to be uh, an earthquake in s approximately this kind of latitude. There are people who can do that. By simply observing the serpent, how it behaves, they say, there is going to be this kind of movement in some part of the planet. So, because any littlest… in even the minutest vibrations in the planet, it is able to sense. 
So because of this, it has a certain uh, awareness or rather sensitivity to certain vibrations. Probably when somebody accesses what we are referring to as consciousness, the other vibrations which are normally everybody's uh, throwing out on a day-to-day -day basis, their physical stuff, their psychological stuff, probably that becomes minimal. Lack of that reverberation is something that a cobra senses. If you become very meditative, well, it won't happen in Belgium because there are no cobras there. But if you are in India, if you become med very meditative, you sit in a forest and become meditative, cobras will gather in front of you. They will come and sit there as if they're waiting for you. This is my personal experience any number of times. And this is… this will be vouched for by any number of yogis in the tradition always because they're able to sense that lack of vibration in the person. When the vibrations become very minimal or very fine, somehow they're drawn to that. I feel uh, for a variety of reasons, because I'm, in my experience, I don't want to go into the detail now, but in my experience, all venomous creatures, those which create venom in their system, all of them are, con are able to sense this. Probably, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just doing guesswork here, it's just uh, guesswork. See, some creature generates venom within itself as an evolutionary process, probably because in some way his uh, physical features and things are such that without a deadly venom, he wouldn't have survived. He is constantly threatened. So, because he's feeling so threatened, you, it's also true in human beings, those who are feeling always threatened, they will carry a lot of venom within themselves. So looking at human behavior, I'm just guessing, maybe in the evolutionary process, because they don't have limbs, let us say the snakes don't have limbs, they don't have the same capabilities that other creatures have, so they might have developed venom over a period of time because otherwise they wouldn't have survived, otherwise they wouldn't have got food to eat, everything around them moves faster, but still they manage to hunt and live only because of the venom that they carry. All venomous creatures, I've noticed this with bees, you know, the honey bees, the way they behave around me, many, many times I've noticed is very strange. In the beginning when it happened, I couldn't believe how these insects seem to be sensing something which nobody else, you know, human beings don't know most of the time, but they're able to see it. I've generally noticed this with all venomous creatures because to generate that venom, there is some special process going on within them. From what I hear from other scientists and, uh, you know, people who are working in the field, they are saying venom is uh, uh, one of the most complex uh, proteins that are produced on the planet. And today, for various neurological ailments, the experiments are going on how venom could be a solution in the future because, you know, in my personal experience, consuming venom has done miracles to me in terms of rejuvenating my body and doing things with myself in so many different ways. If you are… Uh, I don't know if you and Bala are not aware of this, there are certain type of yogis who always carry these mountain scorpions, which are almost like nine inches long, uh, in a box. Once in a way, they will decide when, they will take a sting from the scorpion, your whole neurological system will jangle, it will go for twenty-four hours to forty-eight hours. It won't let you sleep, it will just keep you up. And between pain and pleasure, there is very little distinction. Once the neurological system gets tangled, you know, like jangled in a certain way, you can make it into pain, you can make it into pleasure consciously. So they will cry, they will laugh, they will cry, they will laugh, they will go through this for whole twenty-four to forty-eight hours because they are using the venom to just uh, shake up the whole neurological system. So having said that, somewhere certain creatures have little more access to these things. They may not have access to consciousness, but where there is access to consciousness, they are able to sense that. In my understanding or I would rather say my presumption is that, that they are able to uh, mark out those creatures or those bodies who are uh, least amount of reverberations in them. Where there is least amount of reverberation is like a little bit of a vacuum for them, so they are drawn towards that and at the same time they will not harm that, uh, you know, that kind of reverberation because they feel very passive. 
Like uh, I don't know, right now in the video as I was watching it, there is a video where I am holding a king cobra, not by the head but in the body, it is not a pet cobra or something. We've just caught it three… two, three days before that is being uh, filmed there. And king cobra, if it bites you, you have six to eight minutes to live, that's it. It has enough venom to kill an elephant, but it will not bite. It all depends, if you show a little anxiety, it'll bite you. If you are just absolutely calm, it will not touch you because it's going by the reverb that you generate. So, having said that, this consciousness as a dimension, let's call it a dimension, let's not call it as an experience of wakefulness and sleep, different levels of wakefulness. Well, even when you're awake, not everybody is awake to the same extent, isn't it? Suppose uh, you're teaching in a uh, university, right? Do you find all the students awake at the <laughs> to the same level? When I teach, <laughs> when I teach, yes, hyper-vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> he actually uses that analogy in, in his lectures. Well. He, uses that lecture and he, he uses that analogy where he picks his uh, participants in a lecture and he mm. analyzes and tells them, you're not this much awake and you're this much awake and alert. <laughs> to <attend his> own, <laughs> so, no two human beings are awake to the same extent. So, this whole dimension, if we change the terminology a little bit, probably it will fall into a little better place of understanding, maybe not entirely, but little better. That is, right now when we talk about anesthesia or even coma for that matter, they may be very similar, uh, I don't know medically how you differentiate between the two. Essentially, bodily functions have dropped step by step. In one person, a certain number of uh, functions might have dropped, in another person it might have dropped further, and I would take it further, even what you call as death is just further drop in the bodily functions. So whether it is death, coma, anesthesia, in my understanding and my experience of things, they are not very different. It is just different levels of profoundness of the same thing. When you become completely unawake, that means you're dead. You're little bit awake means you're in coma. You're little more awake means you're under the influence of anesthesia. Little more awake means you just had a drink. <laughs> and your experience, but you have not yet died. <laughs> uh, let's not go into that now. Uh, we'll go into it some other day because uh, you, you… Are you in Brussels? Yes, close to Brussels. Okay. So, unless… unless you serve me french fries, I'm not going to talk all those things to you right now <laughs> I will offer you french fries and Belgian chocolate. The evolution of venomous adaptations in creatures like snakes represents a sophisticated arms race between predators and prey. Venom is a potent cocktail of proteins and enzymes that can have a variety of effects on the victim, ranging from paralysis to necrosis. These toxins are often tailored to the specific needs of the species, with some targeting the nervous system to induce paralysis while others attack the circulatory system causing internal bleeding and organ failure. The production and delivery of venom require a complex interplay of anatomical structures, biochemical processes and behavioral adaptations. For example, some snakes have evolved grooved fangs that allow venom to flow down channels in the fangs and into prey's tissues, while others have developed hinged fangs that fold back when not in use, reducing the risk of self-envenomation. The development of heat-sensing organs in pit vipers represents an extraordinary example of convergent evolution where unrelated species evolve similar triads in response to similar ecological pressures. Pit organs are highly sensitive to infrared radiation, allowing pit vipers to detect the body heat emitted by warm-blooded prey such as rodents and birds even in complete darkness. This ability gives pit vipers a significant advantage over their prey, allowing them to hunt effectively in a wide range of environments, from dense forests to arid deserts. Interestingly, recent research has revealed that the sensory neurons in pit organs are structurally similar for those found in retina of the eye, suggesting that these organs may provide pit vipers with a rudimentary form of thermal vision. Jaw flexibility Snakes exhibit an astonishing degree of jaw flexibility, which is made possible by a combination of anatomical features and specialized musculature. Unlike mammals, whose skulls are composed of several fused bones, snakes have highly mobile skulls with numerous joints and flexible ligaments. 
that allow them to stretch their mouths wide open. Additionally, snakes possess a unique set of muscles called the intramandibular muscles which run along the length of the lower jaw and enable them to move each half of the jaw independently. This remarkable flexibility allows snakes to engulf prey that are several times larger than their heads including mammals, birds and even other snakes. Furthermore, some species of snakes have developed specialized feeding behaviors such as constrictions in which they coil around their prey and exert pressure to suffocate it before swallowing it whole. The fork tongue is a highly specialized sensory organ that plays a crucial role in the life of a snake. Unlike mammals which rely primarily on their sense of smell to detect odors, snakes use their fork tongues to sample chemical cues from their environment. When a snake flicks its tongue in and out its mouth, it collects scent particles from the air or surfaces it comes into contact with. These scent particles are then transferred to vomeronasal organ, a specialized structure located in the roof of the mouth where they are analyzed and interpreted by the snake's brain. By combining information from both fork tips, snakes can determine the direction of the scent source allowing them to track prey, navigate their environment and communicate with other snakes. Additionally, the fork tongue serves as a highly sensitive chemoreceptor capable of detecting subtle changes in the chemical composition of the environment, such as the presence of pheromones released by potential mates. The shedding of skin or ichthysis is a fundamental aspect of the life cycle of snakes and other reptiles. Unlike mammals which grow continuously throughout their lives, reptiles grow in discrete stages with periods of rapid growth followed by periods of quiescence. During the shedding process, snakes secrete a thin layer of fluid between the old and new layers of skin which helps to loosen the old skin and facilitate its removal. Once the old skin has been shed, the snake scales appear bright and glossy and the animal may exhibit increased activity and appetite and it prepares to enter a new phase of growth. Shedding is not only essential for accommodating growth but also for maintaining the health and vitality of the snake's skin. By shedding their old skin, snakes can remove accumulated dirt, parasites and pathogens, reducing the risk of infection and disease. Additionally, shedding allows snakes to repair damage to their skin such as cuts and abrasions by replacing damaged tissue with healthy new skin. Overall, shedding plays a vital role in the maintenance of the snake's integumentary system, ensuring that it remains healthy, flexible and functional throughout its life. These extraordinary features exemplify the remarkable adaptations that snakes and other venomous creatures have evolved to survive and thrive in a wide range of environments. Through millions of years of evolution, these animals have developed a diverse array of anatomical, physiological and behavioral adaptations that enable them to exploit their ecological niche and maintain their status as apex predators in their respective ecosystems. From their venom delivering fangs to their heat sensing organs and folk tongues, each aspect of their biology reflects the incredible diversity and ingenuity of the natural world.